Hey everybody, I just wanted to set up the video we're about to watch. This is actually the video version of my podcast, which is called Life Magnetics, and you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. And in this one, I'm actually talking to intuitive channel and medium, Vanessa Clare. And we have just a great conversation. We cover everything from shadow energy, to thought forms, to blackouts and walk-ins, to channeling mediumship, social media, the fourth dimension, and con conscious and unconscious creation. So this is a really rousing discussion. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have the time, please like and subscribe here on YouTube and also subscribe to my podcast. All right, let's get into it. Well, hello and welcome everybody to the Life Magnetics Podcast. I am your host, Crystal Ann Compton, and I am so thrilled today because I am joined by Vanessa Clare, and you are actually one of the active and proud members of the Light Shine Lab, which is the spiritual community that I founded a few years ago. You're also a moderator in the space, meaning you help it to stay high vibe. You broadcast in the lab. And of course, you've got your own spiritual shenanigans going on in your own life. And so we want to talk about all of that today. And I was hoping we could start by looking at your timeline a little bit and seeing what brought you to this spiritually developed place. I mean, of course, we're all still developing, but what brought you here today? What are the experiences that came before, especially like the supernatural and paranormal experiences? So if you're down to talk about that, I know they're down to listen. So. Oh, heck yes. I'm so excited. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm just going to give you the floor. Like, let's, let's talk about how it all started for you. Okay. Okay. So I remember as a kid, I didn't really have anything like, like, uh, like I didn't see dead people or anything like that. I saw, I, I remember specifically being quite scared of the dark and specifically shadows in corners. They didn't really appear like ghosts or anything, but it definitely had an energy and it was very scary when I was a kid. And I was actually scared of the dark all the way up until I was probably 11 or 12. And, and then I moved in with my father and I shared a room with my little sister. And that's when things kind of like went away as far as that. And then which is really weird. I talked to you a little bit about this before, and I wasn't scared of anything else. <laughs> I wasn't scared of ghosts. I wasn't, in fact, I was fascinated by the afterlife. I was fascinated about quote unquote dark things. I went to a sleepover and we did that light as a feather, stiff as a board game thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, I remember peeking and it working like, people were float or the person we had was so wait, wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> so you're peeking and there's somebody's levitating yeah she's like up off so we all had our fingers like this underneath her her body and we were all in a circle and she was up in the air I mean we were barely touching her and she was up in the air and I remember thinking this is the coolest thing ever like I was not scared I was not like, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like um, a bad energy at all. It was just really exciting. Like, oh my gosh, this is working. And I was really always fascinated with things like that. And um, let's see. Oh, well, I know. Okay. I was going to, I was going to ask you when, when you were, so when you said it started to go away, when you relocated to your father and such like that. How old were you at that time? I was about, okay, so I was probably around 12-ish, 12, 12 okay. 13. That's interesting uh, because for a lot of kids, that ability tends to start to wane at around six, seven, or eight years old. That's just kind of when the pineal gland, I, I read a study that says actually that children from zero to six are in a state of trance. They're in a state of hypnagogia. They're just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. And so that's when children tend to be super psychic, but then it starts to kind of drop off, but, but that you continue to sort of have these feelings and senses till 12 is indicative of me, um, to me of like maybe mediumship or an ability in that. 
Yeah, so. and actually, fairly very recently, like within the last year, I was listening to a podcast and the woman was talking about how she was a very depressed child and there was no reason for it. Like her family were all very caring and loving. She didn't have anything trauma. And that was very similar to my upbringing. No trauma. Um, all, all my family was very caring and loving. Yeah, I was a very, very sad and depressed child. And she said it was probably because of her sensitivities and her ability for being an empath in a, in a medium. She later on talked about how it was mediumship and that resonated with me immensely. So I definitely think that was an, an indication of, of mediumship and abilities later on. It was never like how other people talk about with like being, seeing with their own naked eye, uh, dead people or having imaginary friends. I had this completely different experience. And so I always thought, I always dismissed it as just being afraid of the dark. <laughs> and so you can't connect that to anything, like never a, a, an entity, never a shadow being, just a sense that you had about shadows on the side of your eye, periphery, and dark in general? Yeah, it didn't feel like, I wouldn't have the words to articulate that it was a being, but it was definitely shadows in the corners, mm -hmm. especially up in the high corners. And I feel like they got larger and it was just very creepy and I, I just did not like it at all. So how do you sense they get larger? Like do you? The, oh, the, and, uh, with my naked eye. Yeah. So, so with your <laughs> naked eye, you saw this. That's interesting. I told you before we started, I'm not going to talk a lot. I always talk too much, but <laughs> that's interesting no, because exactly. in Hawaii, you know, we have uh, the belief of Uhani Noho, which are these attachments really that can collect inside of you but also in your space and they tend to congregate in the corners of the ceiling in different rooms and they kind of appear to me as shadow but little like electric um, yeah yeah little electric moving kind of energy and it's their thought forms really yeah so when you started teaching about thought forms that that kind of made me wonder if that's what those were especially because um I mean, there was a lot of things. I, I mentioned that my family is very caring and loving, but there was still like fights and stuff going on, of course. And I, I just wonder if like things have gathered. <laughs> sure. Um, there was another thing that I was going to mention. Oh, yes. I, I also remember I, I would complain about this constantly to my mom. And she eventually uh, used one of my stuffed animals with this bear thing that had like a little pouch and she would like get magic dust and then sprinkle it all over me. And that's for some reason, like really calmed me down. And I loved it. <laughs> that's so powerful though, because you believed it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and, and your belief is what grids the vibration of it. So that's why. Yes. Yes. Um, and another strange thing, I was, while I was writing down all these things, it was all flooding back to me. And another strange thing, I, I had fainted three times in my childhood. Uh, the first time I fainted, I was coming down from upstairs and going into the kitchen. And the next thing I know, I was in like this dreamlike state and everything was black. But I hear, I heard tons and tons of voices all around me. It felt like I was in the middle of a coffee shop with crowds and crowds and crowds of people just talking and talking and talking and talking. And then when I came to, I was like on the floor of the kitchen. <laughs> it was such a weird experience. And then this happened to me again um, while I was trying to gauge my ear with my best friend. We were the only ones at home. And uh, as I was putting the cone into my ear, I all of a sudden, the same thing happened. Everything went black. I started hearing a bunch of voices. And next thing I know, I'm I'm waking up in my best friend's lap. And she's like, she's bawling because she thought I was like dying, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I guess I started convulsing while I was out. And, but I, I felt completely rested, like nothing hurt. There wasn't anything wrong. I felt completely rested. And the only odd thing were these voices that I heard. And, and then we just decided to stop and move on. And then 
the last time, <laughs> the last time I painted, it was in the middle of uh, swim practice. And I was, we got out to stretch. And again, the same thing happened. Everything just goes black. This time though, I was in front of a lot of people. I ended up hitting my head pretty hard, I guess. And making actual, like, people's, the voices that I was hearing, I could start, they were starting to form actual words that I could hear. And then I came to, and the EMS was there, and that's when I actually went to the doctor. And th this is a strange thing. <laughs> so when I told them everything about the voices, feeling really rested after, they didn't know what to say. The doctors had no idea. <laughs> They're like, that's not associated with fainting. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. So they just decided that when I get too hot, I faint. But it's only happened three times, <laughs> and I've gotten hot before. So. <laughs> so, so they ruled out something like epilepsy or a seizure disorder. Correct. Correct. Well, they ruled the, out all of that. So the friend who was with you in the second incident, you woke up in her lap. Did she ever tell you what you were doing? Like, cause she was worried, but what were you doing from her perspective? She said I was like convulsing. Like I looked like I was seizing mm -hmm. and, and that's what the, the people said also happened uh, during my swim team thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the doctors said I didn't have seizures. I didn't have epilepsy. It was just a fainting. So they did a lot of tests too. <laughs> That, and the first one's kind of weird too, because it's happening as you're walking down the steps, but then you kind of come to in a kitchen. So you've traveled from one part to another, but completely blacked out. So let's kind of zoom out a little bit. And now that we've, you know, we're in metaphysics and you're a teacher, you're a reader. And so I'm sure you're, you've thought about that. What is your spiritual conclusion about what happened those three times for you? So I am wondering if I had some kind of experience, out of body experience where I went into the fourth dimension. That's what I think happened <laughs> every single one of those times. I wonder why, I, I wonder why, you know? Cause normally like a spontaneous out of body is when you're in a rested position, you're kind of naturally entering into a tranced out state. And so boop, you're out of your body, but you're lucid. So it's weird that you're walking down the stairs. It's weird that you're you're functioning, doing stuff with other people, and it happens that the that the light body would pop out of the physical body. Like, what would, from a soul level, what would cause that to happen? Because I'm just putting on my thinking hat as I'm thinking about it. Do you do you have any idea why you might just kind of? It's almost like you shift out of physical and into like you're you're so tethered to 4D and beyond that you're kind of riding the lightning maybe the whole time and it's not, it's, it's easy to shift on out and then come back in. But I mean, that's just a layman's, you know, observation. What do you think? Is there a reason do you think spiritually that that was happening? Um, I don't know why it would happen. The only thing that I have ever come to the conclusion of is that maybe spirit was just showing my, showing me that there was another dimension that's the only thing that I can think of. <laughs> well, can I like, <laughs> can we pause on this? Because this reminds me of something that happened to me. And then I have, yeah, like, absolutely. I have a thought that we could just talk about. Um, the first thing this reminds me of is this one time when I was in Colorado and like, like marijuana just became legal. And I'm like, and I, and I grew up in Hawaii. I know all about marijuana and stuff, but I'm like, let me get some, you know, and I got edibles and so with edibles, of course, you've got to give them time before you <laughs> start taking more. And I didn't do, I think I probably had the whole thing. And I went astral cosmic and I started, I was so loosely tethered to the physical body. I was having all of these experiences and I was in a state of panic and I'm like, just go to bed, go to bed, go to bed. So I went to bed, but about two to three hours later, I woke up, I had to go to the restroom and I had to get up and do that. And I'm like, how am I going to make this complete journey, <laughs> this trek of adventure to this bathroom because I'm so high. And I get up and I go, but on my way there, I slipped out of my body. I just went 4D and my physical body just crashed to the ground. I mean, dead weight. I was bruised up, just boom, like a, like a house of cards. And then I clicked right back in and I'm like, oh shit, back in the body. 
and I went and did what I did, but it was so, because I couldn't control it. I just, I was, but my theory is I was already hanging out in 4D because of psychedelics. I was already in the domain of that and trying to physicalize more and just couldn't keep that connection. So I'm wondering if organically for you, maybe you were, you had a- That would make sense. To be that able would make, to do that. That would make so much sense because I, I started, when you first asked me, I started the conversation with, oh, I actually don't remember a lot of my childhood. That's kind of fleeting memories. So that would make complete sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, the second thing I, I thought about is that this can kind of happen with walk-ins. You know what a walk-in is? Um, kind of. I've heard one of my friends actually said that she believes she had a walk-in. But I'm wondering if it's different from what... So, I'm, well, I'm, I'll pass we'll, it on to you. Yeah. I, I don't think there's like one definition of what a walk-in is. So, I mean, this is like my <laughs> loosely working idea of it. But I know Drunvalo Melchizedek claims to be a walk-in. And I think at some point um, an entity came down from a higher dimension, as he tells it, and occupied Drun, uh, Drunvalo's body in order to do the work that Drunvalo is doing. And on a soul level, there was a contract between both souls that that would be okay. And so the man that was Drunvalo exited and this being popped in. So that's kind of a theory of walk-ins. But I also think it's possible to have uh, agreements with entities and energies to kind of um, share that space sometimes. And we do this with channeling, obviously. We share our space with a higher being. And so they can slip in and they can kind of walk into the instrument that we are for us to do what we're doing. So I don't know if that, I don't, I don't know if you were as cognizant and developed at that point to be aware of that, but it's never happened. Well, so let's zoom forward a little bit and talk about the channeling that you do now and the process of that. Does it, are you fully conscious or do you kind of slip out and let somebody else, why are you laughing? <laughs> okay. So Full on channeling has only happened to me one time and it's actually ended up scaring me. It was during the Akashic Records Intensive and Lauren Antwifermo was asking me to read her and I read her and then she, and then as I was finishing up, she asked me to go further. And so I just kind of let go and just let allowed. And it felt like I stepped into this warm, amazing, loving waterfall. And I could tell I was saying things, but they were not me. <laughs> and that lack of control, just the lack of control really scared me. So I was like, nope, <laughs> no more. <laughs> but then, but then I, ever since then, I've been really curious to actually do full on channeling. <laughs> so that's interesting, isn't it? Because yes, it is. <laughs> we could maybe tie that somewhat to losing consciousness, but being very aware of, of 4D and also in a state of peace, right? You're protected, mm -hmm. you're perceiving, you're sensing, but you're not in your body. And so maybe that was a foreshadowing of what your channeling process might be. Oh my goodness. That With, makes complete sense. I know. <laughs> it kind of does. So, all right. Let's go back. <laughs> so that's really interesting. And I can see how that's showing up, you know, possibly showing up now. Um, you mentioned also your Mormonism and your religious upbringing and, and how that informed your spirituality. Do you want to speak a little bit on some of that? Yes. So uh, like you mentioned, I grew up Mormon. And one of the things that we do, which actually I think a lot of Christian faiths do, um, we pray every single night. And in uh, I had a really wonderful relationship with God uh, growing up as a kid. I would, <laughs> it was like, I would just talk to God <laughs> and have conversations and I loved it. And that's why one of the, one of the things about prayer is so, it's so cool and, and resonates with me because it is, it really truly is a conversation with spirit and the power of prayer is, incredible so there was 
there was a time frame. Um, there's this one time where my little brother, he was really young, really young. I think probably four ish. And we couldn't find him anywhere. He, nowhere. I'm talking, we could not find him at all. He was nowhere on our property. He was nowhere in the house. He was, he was nowhere to be found. And everybody was just terrified. And so I remember uh, going somewhere. I think I, I was just in the yard or something. I don't, I'm, I don't know very clearly. And I remember praying so deeply to find my little brother and that he was unharmed and not a minute later when one of the people from our church called my dad and said he was at he was a, around the block playing with his little girl in their house so he must have wandered his way over there and he was unharmed and it it was just it, in that in that moment i was like this is this is amazing <laughs> right and and then there was another time where i got really sick really really sick and the only thing that i really remember from this moment was sitting in a chair and there was my dad and another man from our church and they put some oil on my forehead and they put their hands on me and did a prayer. And I remember feeling so loved, but that's, that's all that I remember. Later on, my dad told me that it ended up healing me. So that's also cool. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are you, are you still affiliated with Mormonism? Do you still practice? No. And actually, so this is why I think I've always been a lifelong seeker. When, when my dad would come to pick me up from my, my mom's house, we would have this, uh, I, I believe an hour long drive from my mom's to my dad. And we would always talk and I would ask a thousand questions. And usually a lot of them had to do with our faith. I had so many questions about our faith and and I think it ultimately led to my dad leaving the church. And then he, he, he actually became a pagan. <laughs> so, so really? um, yeah. So after he left the church, he didn't really expose us too much to paganism. He kind of talked about it a little bit here and there. But after he left the church, he really wanted us to make the decision of what faith we wanted to believe in on our own. And so, so yeah, so, um, so after that, I, uh, after Mormon, I became Catholic for a little bit. I, <laughs> I, um, I left that church and actually for a tiny little blip, I, I ended up becoming atheist thinking, or, well, I guess more agnostic thinking everything was more scientific than it was spiritual. And, I felt like spiritual spirituality was just something that science hasn't discovered yet. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so there was a little bit in there. Um, but now I'm back to, to metaphysics and spirituality. And that's so interesting as you were talking about Mormonism and I know a little bit about it. I grew up in the islands and I was also a missionary for a Christian church and we used to have the like, um, conversion battles with the Mormons, like who can convert more people and save more people? It's ridiculous. But um, so I know a bit about Mormonism, but there's so much, there's so much mythology and like lore and rituals and storytelling. And um, it's so colorful in that way. And so it kind of makes sense that Catholicism would also feel like it fits like a glove because likewise in Catholicism and Christianity for that matter, there's a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of rituals and saints and pomp and circumstance. I actually almost became a Catholic. Uh, that would have been like 2005, 2006. And I was very spiritual and intuitive and I was actually an intuitive reader, but I have always been 
very attracted to that aspect of Catholicism. And I also found the Catholics that I encountered to actually be more inherently interfaith and accepting of other ideas and like reincarnation and clairvoyance and things like that um, than other faiths. So I just, I almost converted, but at the 11th hour, something just fell through like, and it was just not meant to be. And of course that's for the best, but Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can, I can see how that would be part of your Yeah. The traditions really like, I was really attracted to the traditions, uh, how, how they do math how they use um, incense and stuff like that. Like I, I loved it and candles, lighting the candles, candles and praying to the saints and stuff. Like I was very, very attracted to that. <laughs> so how does that, how does that, uh, does any, what is your practice like now? Does that, are you a ritualistic kind of person? Or are you paganistic? What, what's going on with you these days? Um, I think I'm all the above. I, I really enjoy archangels. Uh, Archangel Azrael is my dude. <laughs> I really love working with our Archangel Azrael and um, and actually I've been just starting to to work with Saint Germain and Isis both too so so all the 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 guides is is really my practice and I do I go into meditation I um, I light candles for my meditation so, so I have these uh, they're like 20 minute or oh, or 10 minute ones. Oh my okay. gosh. Mm-hmm. So, they're little meditation candles. I have a bunch of those. You can't probably see them behind me, but I have a bunch of those candles as well. I love I love light. I love candles. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you're 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 so you're authentically ritualistic okay. and and celebratory in that way. So do you do you practice paganism like your father or is your father still with us? Is he no, so no? both my mom and dad are both past. Um, but I, but I still have my stepmother and she's been my stepmother since I was like one years old. So I do refer to her as my mother. So if, if I say my mom then I, and she's living, then it's probably my stepmom. <laughs> okay. So did, did you move in that direction or did you embrace some of those aspects because of your father, do you think? Yeah. So actually my uh, little sister and my little brother, they, my dad taught them a lot more about paganism. Uh, I think they, um, they were more open to it at the time. That was my kind of like in (laughs) my, my atheist (laughs) timeframe. And, um, and then, uh, so my dad taught them, and they actually have a, I wouldn't exactly call it a coven, but some kind of group that they go to in Portland. And ever since I started with the, the Light Shine Lab, <laughs> I've been really interested, and I've been going with them. And we just did a, a Samhain ritual uh, just last week. So that was really cool. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Well, mm-hmm. let's fast forward a little bit to your mediumship again. And I, I wrote a couple of notes about that, going back again to clicking out, going 4D, blacking out, but it's not epilepsy. It's not a seizure disorder. You just get hot. <laughs> um, right. And bringing that back to the present, you know, because it, and I know you have mediumistic ability. I know that you're a medium. And it's kind of f- reminding me a little bit in terms of potential for you of like Edgar Casey which I'm, you're probably familiar with because I know we've been connected. I talk about him quite a bit, but he's referred to as the sleeping prophet. Like now there's a guy who goes, goes away, you know, and he's, he is allowed to be occupied or the instrument of him is allowed to be occupied by his handle, which he called Michael. And he brings forth messages that way, but it was completely unconscious channeling, meaning he's not conscious to what was happening and he could not have told you when he's awoken uh, anything that he said. So no control, just like what happened in the Akashic Records intensive, not present. And in fact, um, in some of his writings, he actually described the process of leaving the body before his handle stepped in to give the messages. And he described kind of lifting up out of the body and experiencing these very distorted and angry faces and 
a lot of that energy that that you're talking about, like in a coffee shop, there's a lot going on in this 4D, right? And he mm -hmm. just kept lifting and kept lifting and kept lifting out of that space. So I'm wondering for you, whether you are, I mean, whether part of your path, and of course, I'm not speaking this upon you, I'm like, I'm just wondering if part of what might be a challenging for you or a challenge that you might want to look at is allowing yourself to partner with spirit in that way to become maybe more of an unconscious channel. There are way more semi-conscious and conscious channels than unconscious. It's actually kind of rare to have an unconscious channel or a completely unconscious vocal channel, somebody who's speaking but not present. But maybe that's something that you could do. Have you ever thought about that? I definitely have thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you still Especially afraid of it? Are you still afraid of it? Do you think? I think there is some fear because it definitely has not come back since. And, but I've been starting out slow with automatic writing and um, I really enjoy automatic writing so far. And I think, I think spirit is just taking it a little bit at a time. And I think I'll eventually get there again. <laughs> Well, let's look at maybe what, where the resistance lies for you, because I find resistance can come from so many different places, like life experience, dogma, doctra, previous belief systems, past lives, you know, resistance mm -hmm. due to what's happened in a previous incarnation. But is the fear for you about being uncontrolled? Like, I don't know, am right. I acting crazy in the streets? Or is the fear about what if a negative entity steps in and I get possessed. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not scared. I'm not scared of that at all. Okay. I'm okay. scared about the lack of control and not like not having, um, not, not having the decision, I guess. <laughs> Does that make sense? Not having the decision on what I say and what I don't say. I, or Hmm. How do I articulate this? So, so do you want to have the final edit? You're the editor I, at large. <laughs> yeah, I, it's just about the control. I think, I think not having any control whatsoever is what's scary to me. Well, and that's just another way to say trust, I think. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, that's it. <laughs> so it's an issue of, of trust. And if you dive into that, what do you think that might be connected to? Ooh, um, have there been times that. in your life where, look at, look at us going here, but have there been times in your life when you have been vulnerable and completely present and you've been rejected that you can pinpoint? Mm, I guess, uh, Growing up, I have always been the really shy child. In fact, my aunt said whenever she babysat me and anytime I like got into trouble, she would put me in timeout and then forget about me because I was so quiet. <laughs> so I've, I've always been the quiet child and always been the like putting, I, I get, oh, ooh. <laughs> I have always, put politeness in the sink of other people before my inner power. Does that make sense? It does make sense. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that was that something that was taught to you? I mean, in the family, or is that something that is inherently part of? It's inherently a part of me. Inherently part mm -hmm. of me. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I think that um, I, and I've often said that, the one big thing you came here to do as a soul is often connected to one big fear you always have to overcome in your life, like thematically, right? So for me, yep. that was public speaking. And I knew, yep. I, I knew I was supposed to speak and I knew I, was, I had a message. I knew that's what my thing was, but I, I didn't get to it until my 40s because I was deathly afraid of presenting people seeing me. I was deathly afraid of speaking. Like I couldn't even speak in front of five people. Like I was hyperventilating a little bit, very choppy. Like it was bad. It was so bad. And that's because 
I believe the universe requires us to look it in the eyes, face the fear and do it anyway, do it anyway. And then the moment you do it, it's like it gives way to the full expression of what your purpose is. So it doesn't surprise me that maybe something that you've actually come here to do that's quite big, spiritually speaking, is tied to this inherent part of you that resists showing yourself authentically, right? And it resists, resists yes. being seen as, as, as an oddity in, in a room full of decorum and people who are polite, like, and here you are just acting crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So you, how do we get over that for you? Like, can we get you to a place where you're willing to like make a fool of yourself? Right. I'm willing like, Oh my God. Hello. I've done this. I mean, and I've, there's been times I've, I've made videos. I've, I've, I've spoken and I did not want to do it. I'm like, really God, I don't, have you seen my hair? It's terrible. I don't feel like it. I don't want to, but I, I did it anyway. And I was nervous about it, but it was always the stuff that made the biggest impact. It was because, because I was afraid I knew I had to do it. Yeah. And I actually, so a lot of people, whenever they have given me readings, they have talked about this light that I have and that, um, I, I'm this light for a lot of people. I just being present for people can, can help people raise their vibration. And I think me coming into my own and inner power and speaking that is, is the thing that I need to break through and move in. Yes, I am definitely with this coming up year. I am, I'm definitely doing it. I'm going to start teaching. I'm going to start practicing daily. I'm really excited about it. (laughs) I'm glad. I find you to be extremely intuitive and extremely gifted and talented. And it's, it's a process. It took me until, you know, for my forties before I really started doing it. Uh, But I really, I really believe in you. And Thank you. I want you to know that I really do. I think you're talented. And so are you, do you offer your services professionally? Like you do? I do. Mm-hmm. And I have this thing where, okay. So prior to this, I was in, I was a pure romance consultant for many, many years, about uh, nine years. And the way that we marketed uh, didn't feel as authentic as I wanted to. So in this career, in this uh, business that I want to build is I really like the idea of just allowing people to be attracted to me. And then if they're attracted to me, then I know that God brought them, spirit brought them and they have, or I have a message for them. And that's, that's the way that I want to definitely do it uh, this time around, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. And, you know, I 100% co-sign that because anytime you try to force the field, especially with something like trying to find clients or people that you can be of service to, like it never works out, right? You always attract it at, at a different frequency. So when you are just being authentically yourself and coming into it with a spirit of like, I just want to bless somebody today and I just want to serve. And there needs to be an energetic reciprocity to that. You know, I'm going to get paid for that. That's awesome. But I'm going to show up and we're going to do this spirit. Like that's when you start really, you really start calling in the people that need you the most. Yes. Let's talk. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. I do want to tell you one more strange thing that happened when I was much older. Okay. (laughs) So, so, okay. Uh, well, kind of actually two things. So the first thing is my now husband, we were dating at the time, um, but we still live together. Uh, we were living in this house. It was a very, very old house. And every morning we would wake up to the thermostat turn to all the way max, maximum thermostat. And at first we didn't think anything of it. We were, were like, oh, somebody must have like knocked it or made up these little things, but it was happening consistently every single night. And there was no way it was our children because they, they were very, very young and they didn't, they didn't have the height or anything to touch it, um, nor would they know what it was or why to touch it. So, so that was interesting. And we also at night would hear footsteps 
So, <laughs> and it's funny too because, like I've mentioned before, I'm I'm not scared of ghosts. I'm not scared of the afterlife. But my husband, he's he's like he's like not so much. <laughs> <laughs> and um I've had to teach him about dominion and sovereignty and like you can just if it's scary just teach him or tell them not to be there <laughs> and uh he's he's coming around to that I think so that's really cool um he's he's seen people at the end of the hallway like pass by so that that was really interesting the the second one that I wanted to tell you this is really cool so my husband, our roommate, so my best friend, we were all in this living room. She was sweeping and I was standing by the closet, the living room closet, and my husband was sitting on the couch and we were all chit-chatting and then it kind of got really quiet and all of a sudden in my my left ear, I hear like this, this like buildup of energy and then I hear very, very clearly, Jessica, the name Jessica, and very clearly and kind of like a, um, like a calling for Jessica. And we, uh, I look to my roommate because her sister, whom we all take, we help take care of her, um, is named Jessica. And so we we look to Angie. And we thought she had called for her. And when I, so I noticed my husband looked at her too. And when she didn't say anything or she's like, what? <laughs> We're like, did, did you say something? And she's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And so I looked to my husband and I was like, did you hear that? He's like, yeah, Jessica. I'm like, oh, what? So we both, we both heard this voice in our ear and I thought that was so cool because later on I was listening to you and Trisha talking about clear audience and how multiple people can hear the same thing I think you talked about a, about Jeremy and um how it when like you when he's on vacation or so, or on a business trip or something you you both like have been able to hear things together. And, and I definitely think that was what happened. Yes. So to explain that to the listeners or viewers, what my husband used to travel a lot every week, like Sunday to Saturday, Monday to Friday, it was like a lot. And every now and again, I would hear him in the house and it was just me and my dogs living on this big property. I would hear him clear as day call me or say something to me. And it was definitely him. And at the time he's over wherever he is thinking about me. And it wasn't uncommon too to get a phone call kind of right after that. Cause he was thinking about me. He was planning to talk to me. And of course he loves me. So there's that, that cord and that connection. But what makes your story interesting is that you both heard it. And I have heard uh, accounts of people like with UFOs, for example, there'll be four people and two people will see the UFO and two people will not. Or there'll be some kind of a light anomaly in the experience and, and a few people will see it, but somebody won't. And I think that's so interesting. And it's, it's probably a frequency thing. Like you're occupying a certain vibration that allows you or opens you to the phenomenon, or maybe you're a match for it in terms of a level, whereas the two other people or the one other person simply is not. And it also makes me wonder whether that's something that actually showed up auditory in your space. Yes. Or if it's something you're both hearing clear audiently kind of as an inner word, but maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. I think it was, I think it was a, a, a ghost or an earthbound. Um, so at, at that time though, it was, I was just barely getting into the light shine lab and actually learning everything. So it's not something like, it's not something that I pursued or anything. It was just, oh, you heard that too. That's so cool. <laughs> Did you ever get to, do you ever, did you ever determine why you think your thermostat was being fiddled with? We're, well, not the why, but we're pretty sure there were, there were earthbounds in that, that's, in that house. That's, that's elect, electronics. You know, they, they can learn how to manipulate the grid and flick the lights and make a sound and project themselves. So that reminds me of my brother because he came to Thanksgiving one year. And of course he's coming in a couple of weeks for Thanksgiving. And he is 
a Christian, right? And he's, but he's so high vibe, just generally. He's a high vibe dude, super high vibe. And, but he has never like seen a ghost. He's never had a spiritual, like paranormal experience. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's like, what, where were you this whole time? Cause I was off the rails, but he came over to my house one Thanksgiving and he went out to fiddle with the thermostat because it was hot or cold or whatever. And he wanted to adjust it and he's standing there doing it. And he hears like plain as day, would you look at this guy? <laughs> would you look at this guy? And he's like, <laughs> it's like three in the morning, like where everybody's asleep. It's not me or my then husband. It's not my kid. <laughs> it was a male voice. And he just froze and he's like, okay, back to bed. <laughs> I don't want to know what any of that's about. So, but I love it. He's like the kind of guy though, that if he just pointed his interest at metaphysics or that kind of connection, I just know that like the, the grid would open unto him and he would have so many different experiences, but you know, he's just never been interested in it. Kind of like Jeremy just isn't curious about it and therefore doesn't experience it in his life. So Unless he comes yeah. to my house. I, oh, we, have, we have some cocky people, I guess, in spirit around the house. Would you look at this guy? I love it. That's so awesome. My my husband is kind of a similar way where he's just not really interested in it. But then ever since I started doing, uh, like taking the courses and, and practicing in front of him and stuff, he's like, he's like, I'm more psychic than you. And he could be. Yeah, he could be. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's cool. It's really about intention and interest and in where you point it. And if you point it at the world of spirit, well, something's going to point back at you. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you also about your mediumship, because I've mentioned a couple of times that you are a medium and you mentioned as a child, you didn't see dead people or anything with your naked eyes or otherwise. Uh, so how is that showing up for you now in your adulthood and in your practice? How does mediumship happen for you? Okay, great question. <laughs> so I am very clairvoyant. And actually, Amber Poole uh, brought this to my attention. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a very, very vivid imagination. And um, so I could put myself inside of my make-believe realms so easily and see things and, and all that. And, and when I mentioned that, I think I mentioned it in passing with Amber and she's like, oh, that's, that's your clairvoyance. <laughs> you, you are clairvoyant. <laughs> and I embraced that and completely, I was like, it was a, it was a light bulb moment. Oh, 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 I can see things in my mind's eye. Okay. Okay. I got this. And, um, doing mediumship, that's, that's how I do see, I see, I get things in the form of pictures, um, scenes. I will see people, uh, but in my mind's eye, not my naked eye. And so what I do is I just describe it to people and they're like, yep, that's so-and-so. Do the impressions, the, the visual impressions have a different feel to them than what you normally would be imagining about or thinking about? Like, do they, how do you know that they're mediumistic versus just regular thinking and envisioning? Great question. So yeah, they definitely have a, a feeling to them, a density to them. So a, if I'm just thinking st something, it, it feels, it doesn't have a feeling. Whereas if I'm seeing something mediumistically, it feels like love, to be honest, <laughs> like to be straight, to be frank. Um, it just, it has a, a feeling of love and subtlety and when I feel into that feeling, so, so this is interesting. I've wondered about this actually. I've wondered if I'm just feeling a spirit or if this is actually a combination of clairsentience because I've heard of other people talk about feeling like in their own bodies and this isn't something that I feel in my body. I feel it 
energetically, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if it's just, it's just my way or a spirit's way of telling me, yeah, this is, this is how you uh, discern the, di the differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me, you know, that, that the images themselves would be maybe more vivid or have that density, that weight that you're talking about, but accompanied by a frequency of the transaction. So when you channel, it feels a certain way, right? Yes, your your yes, body yes. feels a certain way. Um, when you read somebody intuitively, that feels a certain way. And then when yes. mediumship information and energy starts coming in, that's going to have an accompanying frequency. And then the stuff comes online and you can start describing it. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I always likened, well, mediumship impressions, especially to a really anchored memory. So like if you if you would were to remember the day you graduated from high school and if you were to sit down and really think about well what was i wearing what color was my robe what were my shoes like who was around me like really orient into it and get into that memory that's density that's the density i think you're talking about it feels different than if i'm thinking oh yeah i had chicken last night you know that's that's just a not, that's a floaty kind of uh, non important type of a feeling versus something that's anchored in something. And so if it's coming in yeah. mediumistically, it's anchored in that love, which is what you're yes. also feeling clairsentiently. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's awesome. Well, before we close and we, I've had such a good time. Thank you so much. Um, I've been, you. I've been asking folks, especially intuitive folks like you, what your impression might be for 2022 and beyond. Of course, here in the United States, 2021, Things are a little jacked up, Vanessa, I got to tell you. <laughs> it's a little crazy out here. And I know people are really, really impacted by what they're seeing as reality. And we were having a really cool conversation about social media and 4D before we actually started recording. But how do you think we move in this energy from 2021 into 2022? And what do you kind of see coming up for us if you want? And if you want to pull a card, you could do that too. However you want to comment, if you do. Okay, so um, feeling into this, I <laughs> we we kind of talked about it a little bit, and it it feels like it might get worse before it gets better. But the other thing to that, the other feeling with it is, I think it's actually really really good. Number one, um, all this this light is being shown on the on the shadow work that we as a collective need to be doing. So that's number one. And number two, I think a lot of people are going to get really clear about who they are, what their values are. And I really actually think that this is a potential a potential for all of us to to raise our vibration and to really um, look at ourselves and and get clear about what our values are, not necessarily like be mean to other people, but being, no, this is who I am. These are my boundaries. 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 Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it could have a lot of good in it. Always. There's always a polarity, right? And I think within America, we tend to think, oh, this is an American problem. All the things are, but it's happening all over the world. Like, yeah. All of your major countries are, are having turmoil, divisiveness, mm -hmm. clash of values, mm -hmm. and trying to create a path forward, which is why I think the issue of social media is actually really important because one thing we all have in common is our connection points on, in social media. And when we're connecting with others via social media, it truly is happening here in the third dimension. I'm looking at my phone. I'm talking to Vanessa. But it's also happening in the ether, in the etheric realms. You call these the astral realms. And dimensionally speaking, it's happening in the fourth dimension, which already is a dimension somewhat of chaos. It's a portal mm -hmm. dimension, mm -hmm. but it's where you find ghosts. It's where you find the recently deceased, the dreamers. And there's a lot going on there. I, all the voices that I was hearing, all that chaotic. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. I, I describe it as like the uh, the bar scene in Star Wars with all the weird aliens just partying. Yes. I don't know what's going on yes. here. It's a little nuts though. Uh, so it's like, it's a lot like that, but we're having that interaction in 3D, but also 4D. And the thing to note about that is that that is a creative landscape. Yes. Thoughts become 
uh, your thoughts become things much more rapidly than in 3D. There's a process we go through. It takes a while to manifest mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. due to time and space and such. But in 4D, there's, there's no restraint there. So whatever we're thinking in 4D, we're also crystallizing in 3D. And so what's happening on the planet, I believe, is as a result of us hanging out in 4D via social media and otherwise, and just being absolutely toxic. <laughs> I mean, just defaulting to toxic, defaulting to not believing in somebody, defaulting to negativity, and also agreements, right? Agreements. Agreement. Mm -hmm. Scrolling your timeline and that friend who's going off about something nuts, you know, maybe politically, maybe spiritually, we just send a little like though. Well, I, I love her. I'm going to like it. I'm going to agree mm -hmm. to that. I'm not going to mm -hmm. call it out. I'm not going to have a boundary. I'm not going to point my interest away from it. I'm going to agree to that. And in doing mm -hmm. so, you activate a powerful spiritual universal law, which is mm -hmm. when you and I agree on something, we compel our father, our creator to do it. Yes. Yes. So let's talk about this in 2022. This is like my big thing. What are we agreeing on collectively? Yeah, we is have an opportunity to yes. really like change and shift that to, to agree on things that are, are good for the world and, and uplift the world instead of necessary uh, the, the chaos. The, the separation. Yes, we have yeah, an opportunity to consciously agree and therefore consciously create. Because we're creating now by our default throwaway agreements that we're making, out of integrity. And it's it's yeah. it's more laziness and non-presence than it is intentionally agreeing to trashy concepts <laughs> and therefore yeah. creating more trash. It's more apathy. It's like, oh, okay. and it's it's connecting into somewhat vitriolic, angry, uh, constantly witch hunty kind of energy and participating in it and therefore growing it. And so, yeah, I don't see that ending anytime soon. So I'm going to co-sign what you just said. It, I do think it's going to be worse before it's better. Do you have a sense as to when it might start to get better up on this planet, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> up in here? Okay. Let me, let me zoom into this. Um, Uh, so actually it, for me, it feels like around the 2025 is what's coming to me when things are going to start shifting and feeling really starting to change in a, in a, um, productive way. <laughs> I think 2025, it's going to be like this. Hmm. Wind's changing a little bit. Yeah. I can feel something shifting, changing, but then. 2027, 2028, end of this decade, like actual fundamental shifts that are changing our lives will take place. Yes. I, yeah, that's what I, that's what I sense too. It's interesting because so many people are like, oh, it's going to be great. No, it's going to be so good. No, I, let's just call a thing a thing. I mean, we got some work to do, right? We have some work to do for sure. And let's get intentional. Let's get intentional and let's bring in the love and let's, let's, let's figure out, let's get solution oriented. <laughs> let's 100%. Well, Vanessa, this has been so fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. Can you tell us how to get in touch with you, how to reach out, how to follow you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Vanessa Claire and uh, you can check out my website. It is, uh, it's a little bit different, so I'll have to give you that URL, <laughs> but okay. it's Vanessa Claire Solutions. Vanessa Claire Solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's going to be, if you're watching this and you already see it below her, but it's also going to be in the description of this podcast or this video. So do check it out because truly Vanessa, you are a very talented and heart led intuitive and medium. And I just love you so much. So thank, thank you for you being so with much. us. I love you too. <laughs> Bye guys. Love you all. The Lightshine Development Circle is a sacred place for spiritual seekers to practice giving and receiving readings. The circle is open to all psychics, oracle card readers, mediums, channels, energy healers, Akashic Records readers, 
and any other type of spiritual practitioner who offers their service via a reading style format. If you're ready to awaken your gifts and talents and fine tune your intuitive abilities, we'd love to have you in the circle.